Okay. Matthew. Sure. Thanks a lot. I wanted to ask you, um, on Burundi, the eunuch in Bujumbura, uh, Beatrice Nigo Nibogora is quoted that Ban Ki-moon will visit the country February 22nd mm -hmm. and 23rd. Uh, is that the case, and what, is it, what are his goals, and is he aware of the, the recent pattern of house demolitions and seizures of those who have left in I fear? I think the Secretary General is very clearly aware of the situation in Burundi and the continued violence and the lack of progress on the political talks. And when we're able to officially announce the visit, uh, we will. And I, I, Okay. So, but it was, I mean, it seems like it was announced there. Was there some? I, I, all right. What I wanted to ask is I, a different New York Times question. There's an editorial in today's New York Times calling on this <clears throat> to call the horror, you know, tale of horror at the UN about the sexual abuse allegations. Mm -hmm. And it concludes recommending, as, as the editorial board, it is time to exclude countries that do not impose necessary discipline to make zero tolerance possible. And I wanted to, I guess I wanted to know, it's often said that the Secretary General is waiting for member states to do X, Y, and Z. This recommendation to simply, as DPKO, say we are not taking member states that do not meet these standards. Isn't I that think, something that he you know, do I himself? Think the, the Secretary General, more than anyone here, shares in, in, in the dismay and, and horror of what we've seen of, of vulnerable people being abused uh, by peacekeepers, whether they be UN peacekeepers or international peacekeepers. Um, he has, I think you've, you will have noted that on a number of occasions, uh, whole contingents have been repatriated uh, when they did not uh, perform uh, to standards. Uh, this is obviously something that we continue to take uh, very seriously. Uh, it is important that uh, those troops that are uh, serve under the UN flag uh, perform at the highest standards, protect uh, who they're supposed to protect. Uh, and if they don't uh, live up to those standards, um, as we've seen in the past, a number of them have been uh, repatriated. Uh, other measures are being, uh, are being put into place. The Secretary General's um, upcoming report to the General Assembly obviously will be, uh, I think will be make an interesting uh, read. And as you know, he's recently appointed Jane Hull Lute uh, to sort of coordinate uh, the UN system's response uh, to all these horrendous allegations. Just one more direct question on this. I just got because the difference would, I guess, would be between what they're proposing and what you've said is you, you deploy and then if something goes wrong, you repatriate or move to mm -hmm. some months down the road, repatriate. They're trying to say, if a country is shown not to have the systems in place to prosecute, don't deploy in the first place. What do you, you think know, of that I think, idea? You know, I think all these things need to be, uh, need to be looked at. It's obvious that anyone who is deployed, uh, needs to, uh, all the troops need to perform to the highest standards, and that the fight against sexual sexual abuse uh, is one that is not for the Secretary General, that it's a partnership with the Security Council and with those countries that contribute troops. Mr. Lee. Sure, thanks a lot. Uh, yesterday I'd asked Fairhan about this letter uh, um, from staff in Kenya mm -hmm. to, to Ban Ki-moon and OIOS mm -hmm. about Yon, John, Yon Close. Mm -hmm of Habitat complaining about things that he said that had, a, a, they believe, a racial nature. And I, he said to ask Habitat. So I, Habitat has confirmed they received the letter. Mm -hmm. But I still want to ask, since the letter was, in fact, addressed to OIOS and to Ban Ki-moon, particularly in the OIOS case, does OIOS have jurisdiction over Habitat? Is the, has a decision been made that this letter will only be considered by Habitat itself, who is uh, run by yes, the... Yes, so OIOS, if I'm not mistaken, has jurisdiction over Habitat. Uh, we're obviously very much aware of the... Uh, of the allegations in the letter, uh, and we're examining the claims according to due process. Do you have anything on the Sudan? I just wanted to ask you, the, 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 the Sudan staff that they... they, no, they I, I don't have an update. Okay. Okay. I will go get our guest. Matthew. Uh, Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access. Thanks a lot for the briefing. I want to ask you about technology and this idea that, that for example, there can, you know, uh, there's a phone app out that could sense earthquakes called MyShake. And I know, uh, first of all, how... Just generally, can you say what you think technology can do to, to help people at least avoid injury and disasters? And also, can the UN, I, I saw, I've seen as to that one, the idea is to try to get it put into phone operating systems. Is there any, uh, is your office trying to, to use the UN's, you know, universal nature to get these things uh, more, more widely used? Thanks. Thanks. That gives me a great opportunity to relate a personal story in response to that. Um, so first of all, technology is a huge role to play. After the tsunami, the Indian Ocean tsunami, uh, there was a huge effort to put in place early warning for tsunamis, buoy systems, and so on, that is clearly going saving lives and will save lives in future. 
But there are huge limits to technology, and here's the personal story. Um, I was in, uh, I'm Australian, but I was uh, in the US in uh, Northern California uh, in December, in uh, just near Sacramento, which is a city in California, some of you, I'm sure you know. Yeah. And I was having lunch in a restaurant, and suddenly every single cell phone in the restaurant went off at the same time. And I looked down, this is ironic given the job I was starting, and it said, take cover immediately, tornado heading your way. And I looked up, everyone in the restaurant sort of were looking at the phones, chatting, and then they went right back to eating. And it's because there had never been tornadoes in this part of the country. And I went outside to have a look, and I could see the clouds that was moving in a different direction. But it highlighted for me that it, that's a, the technology is an important piece. This is really, you know, getting that cell phone message was amazing, but it's not enough, um, particularly in say, places that don't often get emergencies. But in terms of the UN, we, UNISDR hosted a major conference just two weeks ago in Geneva on... Uh, the science and technology to support disaster risk reduction. And there are, the technology you mentioned is really interesting. In Mexico, for example, there's, they now have sensors that send warnings to people in buildings immediately. Um, and they, they have about 30 seconds to move away from the windows and skyscrapers and take shelter. Sometimes they're false alarms, but, and uh, so there, there are, it's what was remarkable about this global meeting. We had 700 people from around the world, experts and scientists, were the range of technologies that are being developed. So the idea is to now begin identifying ones that we can apply effectively.